The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, no living witnesses. It is 11.30 a.m., a Monday morning in November 1939. Sheriff Ross Betsby turns his car into a quiet residential street of Harper's Landing, Texas. Seated in the car with him is Mrs. Blackburn, a medical assistant. She becomes increasingly nervous as they approach a sign marking the home of Dr. Walter Hennett. Now, don't go getting jumpy, Miss Blackburn. There could be a hundred reasons for the doc to be missing. Not Doc Hennett, and you know it. It ain't like him to just disappear. No sign of him since Saturday night. Wasn't at church yesterday, and he ain't at his house this morning. He's always there for visiting hours at 9.30. So he's probably out on a house call. Maybe over to the hospital at Ridge Hill. If he was, the phone operator would know about it. Besides, his car is still in the garage. Well, here's the house. Better get out of the car and see if we can't raise him. That's what I've been trying to do all morning. You sure he wasn't at church yesterday? Of course I'm sure. He always gave me a ride home to my place, and I'd always make Sunday breakfast for him before he'd start on his house calls. You don't work for a man for ten years without learning his habits, especially a doctor. Well, he's got to be around someplace. Doc? Hello, Doc? Doc? Doc Hemet! Don't you have a key, Miss Blackburn? Never needed one before. Front door to the waiting room's always been open, except at night. Of course, he could have driven off with somebody, but... Oh, I don't know. But if he's here, why doesn't he answer? Well, even doctors get sick. And Doc Hammett's no youngster. He might have had a stroke. Oh. What are you going to do, Sheriff? We got to get inside. I got no legal right to bust in without a warrant. But that'll take time, and maybe this can't wait. Why don't you just go in, then? Doc knows you. He'd understand. If he doesn't understand, I reckon he'll just have to sue me for a broken window. I'll knock this one in with my gun, then I'll climb in and let you in through the door. Well, hurry. All right, come in. Where's Doc's bedroom? Back here. Not here. Bed's been used, though. It was all made up Saturday night when I left. Then he slept here Saturday night. Bathroom door is open. Nothing in there. Reckon we better go through the rest of the house. Kitchen's clear. You can see out back through the windows. There's nothing there, either. Sheriff, I'm... I'm frightened. The sliding door to his office was closed when we come into the waiting room. Better have a look at that office. If he isn't in here, I don't know. Oh, Oh, Sheriff! Better stay back, Miss Blackburn. Oh, Dr. Hammett! Dressed in a robe and pajamas. Must have had a heart attack. Come in here to get something for it and... Wait a minute. What is it? Oh, his robe. It looks like blood. Tis blood. From a bullet wound. He's been murdered. Sheriff Betsby made an immediate request for the aid of a Texas Ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. He joined the sheriff at the home of Dr. Hemet shortly after 1 p.m. 
Jace. <laughs> uh, this is Miss Blackburn. She was Doc's helper. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson, Miss Blackburn. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. I asked Miss Blackburn to stay until you got here. Reckon she knows more about Doc than anybody. I gather you didn't live here in the house, ma'am. No. I have my own place. I don't know just what I'd like to ask you yet until I look around. Would you mind waiting a little longer? I'll stay as long as you need me. Thanks, ma'am. Where's the body, Sheriff? In the office. Through that sliding door. I've been keeping it closed off. Nobody's been in here but me and one deputy. He just took a couple of pictures. Good. Medical examiner been here yet? No, but he'll be along soon. He's driving down from Hesterville. Mark alongside the doc's temple here. Bruise about two inches long. It's a pretty heavy blow. Looks like he might have been knocked out with a gun barrel. Yeah, that figures. Because he wasn't standing up when he was shot. He was lying here on the floor. What makes you think so? Bullet went right through the chest and buried in the floor under him. I moved him a little and I dug the slug out. Here. Forty-five. Yeah. There's something funny about this, though. Quite a bit of blood on this examination table, almost six feet away from the body. Yeah, I wondered about that myself. The instrument tray and surgical dressings pulled up beside the table. There's a couple of hypodermic needles that look like they've been used. Well, Jace, Doc couldn't have been trying to treat his own wound. He, he never moved after he was shot. If that slug wouldn't have been in the floor right under him. Of course, he, he, he might have staggered around before he was shot, after he got hit on the head. It still wouldn't account for the blood on this table. There was no bleeding from the mark on his head. That means the blood on the table comes from somebody else. Medical examiner can type it for us later. I want to see Mrs. Blackburn for a minute. We can use some help from you now, Miss Blackburn. I'll tell you anything I can. Mrs. Blackburn, was it part of your job to clean the doctor's office? Yes. Every day after his final visiting hours. According to the sign outside, his evening hours were from 5 to 7 p.m. That's right. You clean the place after 7 p.m. Saturday night? Yes. What time did you leave? Well, the doctor had a few calls to make after visiting hours. House calls. I waited until he got back and fixed his dinner for him. I reckon it was late when I left. After 10 o'clock. Uh-huh. Look through the door of the examination room for a minute. Yes, sir. Is that surgical tray usually in that position? I mean, did you leave it like that Saturday night? Why, no. Everything was put away in the cabinet. How about the examination table? You clean that off Saturday night? Yes. Was the doctor expecting any patient after you left, late? No, no, he said he was going right to bed. And he must have gone, too, Jace. The bed had been slept in, and you can see what he was wearing. Poor doc. I, I think it would be all right for you to go home now, ma'am. If I need any more information, we can reach you there. Thank you. Uh, tell the deputy outside that I said to drive you home. Well, I'd, I'd as soon walk. Get the mayor. Yes, well, thanks for helping, Miss Blackburn. Well... That settles one thing, Jace. Doc had an unexpected patient late Saturday night. Somebody who routed him out of bed and killed him. But why? I got an idea. It was to keep the doc from calling you. Keep him from calling me? What do you mean? Whoever came here was hurt, bleeding. So it wasn't a planned visit. Not somebody who came here deliberately to kill the doc. Doc was killed to keep him from talking about the visit. Oh, Doc Hammond would never talk about a patient's business? Only in one case, where the law would require it. He'd have to report it if he treated anybody for a bullet wound. Yeah, that's right, Jace. That could be it. That probe on the instrument tray has blood on it. And that's just what a doc could use to dig out a bullet. I know. I've had a few dug out myself. Let's comb this examination room again. What are you looking for? If we're right, the slug Doc Hammett dug out of his patient. <laughs> We found it, wrapped in a piece of blood-stained gauze in one of the trash containers. There was something else in the container, too, part of a faded blue denim shirt that had been used to bind a wound. It must have been a bad wound, Jace. That denim was soaked. Yeah, and take a look at this slug. Looks like a slug from a savage 303. But Doc was killed by a 45. That's natural. The man who came here wounded was shot someplace else by somebody else. It wouldn't be the same gun. The fellow we're after must have been in a gunfight then. That's the way it shapes up. With all that blood, he couldn't have come far. Couldn't have waited too long to get to a doctor. And the chances are he wasn't alone. Somebody must have been helping him. Oh, they could have just left Doc knocked out, trussed him up and gotten away. Why'd they have to kill him? I can't answer that one. When the medical examiner gives us the wounded man's blood type, I'm going to send the two slugs we've got through to Austin for a ballistic check. 
Get a rundown on every police report involving gunplay that took place anywhere within 100 miles of here on Saturday night. The medical examiner came and after a quick check gave us the blood type of the man we were after. I arranged for the two slugs we had to be sent through to Austin at the same time phoned for a complete report on all shooting incidents that had occurred on Saturday night. Then the sheriff and I started the drive to his office. This looks like a tough one to me, Jace. We got a blood type to check for, but I reckon a million people in Texas have type O blood. Yeah, but not all of them are going to have a recent bullet wound they can't account for. You're right. If we find one who's been wounded. But for all we know, the man Doc treated might have got himself shot by accident. If he did, he wouldn't have killed the doc to keep him from reporting it. I guess you got me hogtied on that point, Jace. But all the same, I don't know. Hold it a minute, Sheriff. KTXA to Unit 10. That's for me. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Have info you requested on cases involving firearms. None report in your general vicinity for Saturday night. 10 4. There is possible lead, though, Unit 10. What is it? Body of man killed by gunfire discovered a few hours ago on slope of Thunder Ridge, Roebling County. About 70 miles west, your present location. Time of death, not yet determined. Waiting report of medical examiner. 10 4. Is another unit assigned to that case? Unit 3 covering. This unit proceeding to join Unit 3 to explore possibility of link between two killings. 10 4. Best approach to scene is west slope of Thunder Ridge. We'll have to leave car, go in mounted. 10 4. Unit 3 making contact by field set. We'll notify Unit 3 if you're coming. 10 4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA Austin. You think that might hook up with us, Jace? It's the only thing that's turned up. Another ranger unit's there, Unit 3. That's Steve Clark. We can work it together. Suppose I leave you on deck here to cover anything that turns up. Suits me. Just drop me at my office. Even if this fellow you're going to see was killed on Saturday night, Jace, it could still be a coincidence. I know. But it'll stop being a coincidence if he was killed by the same 45 that was used to murder Doc Hemmett. <laughs> I dropped the sheriff off, then headed for Thunder Ridge. When I got to the base, I unloaded charcoal from my horse trailer and started the climb. The sun was sinking as I started up the slope, and darkness came fast. I spotted torches moving like fireflies. I rode for them. Easy, easy, charcoal. Watch your footing, boy. Hello there. Hello. That you, Steve? Yeah. Jake? Right. Coming up to you. Hold up back there. Let your horse. Uh, howdy, Steve. Howdy, Jace. <clears throat> Got a walkie-talkie message you were coming. Didn't come down the road to meet you because we wanted to get the body out of here. The medical examiner can't do much till we get it into town. Where is the body? Back there on a pack mule with the sheriff's deputies. I'm leading the way down. Uh, might as well get moving then. I'll ride with you. Right. All right, we're going to move again. Follow this gully all the way down and watch your step. Right. Come on, boy. Come on, Charky. Any line on how long he's been dead? Not for sure. But I think it's going to fit in with what you're looking for. What I can judge, he was killed Saturday night. You got anything to back that up? Yeah, the man's a cowpoke. Works on that ranch at the base of the ridge. He rode up here Saturday night to see some Mexican gal he's been courting. But he never did get back to the ranch after he left her shack. I wonder why anybody traveled all the way up here to kill him. He was ambushed on the way back to the ranch. It'd been just as easy for the killer to wait until he hit the flat down by the ranch. Funny you should say that. Why? Because he was shot down on the flat. Well, then how'd his body get up here? Uh, near as I can figure, he started to ride back up to get help. He wasn't killed right off, fell out of the saddle, and died where he fell. Seems to me he'd have ridden on to the ranch for help. Yeah, the ranch house is 11 miles off. Back up this way was only one mile. Chase, I'll be able to show you the whole thing when we get down. I'll follow his tracks both ways. Say, you, you leave your car near mine? Yeah. Well, the shooting took place not far from where we're parked. There was a break in the fence there and the marks of a truck... But they weren't deep enough to make a cast of them. You mean whoever gunned him had a truck down there? Yeah, that's right, Jase. Or say, there are cattle tracks all over the place, too. Well, that might mean he surprised somebody who was trying to run some stock off the place. Yeah, not only trying, but succeeding. A few white faces that were grazing in that section can't be located. Did this fit in with your doctor killing? Depends on whether your cowpoke was killed by a forty-five and whether he returned fire and hit one of the men he saw down there. And he fought with him, all right. He was carrying a saddle rifle. He dropped it when he got hit, I reckon. I found it beside his tracks down below. I already sent it on to Austin. 
Only one thing you got to tell me then, and I'll know if the two killings go hand in hand. What kind of a rifle was the cowpoke using? What kind are you looking for, Jase? Savage 303. You got a case. That's what it was. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. We're boasting a little because here at NBC, you'll find the roughest, toughest, most romantic crime fighters ever assembled under one network roof. Take Wednesday evening, for example. On Wednesdays, you'll hear action with Mr. District Attorney, The Big Story, and that new daring private eye, Rex Saunders, played by Rex Harrison. So just keep your mystery ear glued to your NBC station every Wednesday. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, No Living Witnesses, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The cowpoke and Dr. Hammett had been killed by the same man, all right. Ballistics proved the bullet dug out of the floor from under the doctor was a twin to the forty-five taken out of the murdered cowpoke. Steve Clark and I put our horses in the double trailer I was towing and headed for Harper's Landing. Ballistic boys at the lab didn't take long comparing those slugs, did they? They never do. It all fits. They even test fired the cowpoke's rifle. It fired the slug Doc Hammett took out of that patient we're looking for. We're not only looking for him, we're going to find him and whoever was with him. It must be more than one man, all right. What you told me about the blood on that piece of denim shirt, he couldn't have been in any condition to drive by himself, not all the way to Harper's Landing. Yeah, 70 miles. And he must have known he was going to need a doctor. Hey, you look like that gives you an idea. It does. I think it answers a question the sheriff asked me. Why they killed the doc instead of just tying him up. And what's the answer? They killed him because they didn't just happen by his place. They knew Doc Hammett, and he knew them. That's a big conclusion, Jason. That's not hard to reach, either. Look, Steve, Doc Hammett's house in Harper's Landing isn't on the main street through town. It's on a side street, not easy to find in the middle of the night, unless you knew where it was. Not only that, but they had to pass through two bigger towns on the way there, towns with more than one doctor. Steve, if you were shot and wanted to keep it covered, but you had to be treated, what would you do? Well, go to my own family doc, I reckon, and hope that I could talk him into keeping it quiet. Hey, you're right, Jase. That means the men we we're after must live in or near Harper's Landing. Well, let's say on a ranch somewhere outside the town. Some place they could have taken stolen cattle. We know the brand mark and those stolen white faces. Say, we're going to do some range riding? Until we find them. Until they show up for sale at some commission house or auction barn. You think the sheriff will be willing to ride with us? Of course he will. Doc Hammond was a friend of his, and the sheriff doesn't take to killers. <laughs> Larson Ranch is about two miles farther on. Might stop there and get some grub if you'd like. I'm all for it, Sheriff. How about it, Jase? Haven't taken much eating time for the past two days. Oh, uh, why don't you just grab a handful of range grass? It's loaded with vitamins. <laughs> You'll be loaded with buckshot if you come up with any more ideas like that. Yeah, come on, Jase, before we get so skinny that a gust of wind will lift us right out of the saddle. Okay, okay. I guess the horses can use a rest. You see there, Sheriff? He don't care about us, just the horses. Well, look who's talking. I never saw you sit down to a meal without seeing to it that your horse was fed and watered first. I was only kidding, Jase. Let's get out of that Larson place. All right. Get up, boy. Okay. Get Get up, Turkey. I wish we'd find some sign of those white faces. We must have looked over a couple of thousand head without finding a single altered brand. Well, they got to be around, Steve. They haven't been sold through any commission house or barn. All records have been checked back through last Saturday. Yeah, we better find them soon before too many people know what we're doing. Ranchers who've seen us know we're not riding this range for exercise. Yeah, at the Larson Ranch off there to the right of the Mesa. There? Nope, that place belongs to Yancey Coburn and his son, Jed. Yeah, pull up a minute. Ooh, oh, boy, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh. Yeah, those cattle are acting kind of funny, Jase. Yeah. Disturbed and excited, milling around. Can't see any reason for it. Wide open range. No sign of a coyote or a mountain cat. Yeah, must be something they smell. I've seen them act just that way when a beef has been slaughtered on the range. Blood smell stirs them up and they start bunching just like that. No, oh, nothing in that herd to interest us, though, Jase. Can see none of them's white faces. Yeah, white parts might have been painted over. You know, that kind of camouflage has been used before. I can't tell till we get close up. We're going to have to check them sooner or later. Might as well be now. Well, there goes our lunch, Steve. Yeah, I guess they eat on the Coburn place, too. Yeah, but Yancey and Jed ain't exactly hospitable. Well, 
Come on. Get up, boy. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, they're bunching right along Coburn's fence line. That's good. We won't have to cut the fence. We can just tie the horses off there and climb through. They sure are acting up. All right, hold up. Ooh, oh, ooh, Charky. Oh, oh. I'll hold the wire, Jason. Thanks. Climb through, Sheriff, and I'll come through and hold it for Steve. Right. Okay, Steve. Come ahead. Okay. I'm clear. Let it go. Yeah. Ain't no strange stock here, Jace. They're all wearing Coburn's brand. Yeah, I can't spot any that have been altered. Besides, there's not a white face in the lot. You see that plane now. What are they so head up about? It beats me. What are you looking at, Jace? Tracks. The way they've been milling around. Marks form a big circle. The boulder over there seems to be the middle of it. They move up toward it, and then they start to mill and pull back. Come on. Wow. Look at the mess of red ants around that boulder. Well, they're just pouring in and out of that varmint hole under it. Hey, look at them. That hole's bigger than it looks. Most of it's been covered by the boulder. Hey, let's see if we can move it out, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Jam too tight, Jake. Yeah, there's enough of an opening for my arm. I'll stretch flat and stick my hand down there. Well, watch out, Jake. You'll get ants all over you. I don't care about the ants so much. I just hope I don't get a mess of gopher teeth in my hand. Feel anything down there? Yeah. Look, quick line. Hey, Jace, you better wash that off right away. I will. You got your wire clippers? Sure. What's the matter? Cut the fence and bring the horses through. We're going to pull this boulder. Why, Jace? What's down there? It felt like a bunch of fresh-skinned beef hides. They were hides, all right. Stripped from a half-dozen white face. The place where the brands should have been were burned over to obliterate what had been there. Packed the hides on our horses and headed for the Coburn Ranch house. They sure wiped out any proof on those hides, Jace. Yeah. If there wasn't something wrong with them, they wouldn't have gone to the trouble of hiding them. Pretty smart butchering the stuff before they sold it. Probably figured every commission house in the state would be watching for brands. They couldn't risk altering them, and they couldn't risk keeping the stock around. You seen the Coburns lately, Sheriff? I haven't seen Jed for some time, but I saw Yancey only last night at the drugstore in town. Yeah? He buying something? Yeah, he was. A lot of stuff. Bandages, adhesive tape. I saw the druggist wrapping it up. Sounds like the stuff he'd need to change dresses and a bad wound, Jace. Hey, we're coming to their sheds. The house is just the other side of them. Ride right into the sheds. Leave the horses there. I don't want them to see these hides yet. Okay. Here we are. Oh, boy. Oh, Ooh, oh, oh Charlie. Take a look on that floor there, Jace. Over there. Yeah. One spot cleaned up mighty good. But look, look at the beam right over it. Meat hooks, a little blood on them. Yeah, must have done his butchering right here. Made awful sure to get that floor clean. Let's go talk to him. There's Yancey now at the back screen door. Uh, uh, howdy, Yancey. What you fellas want on my place? The rangers want to have a little talk with you. I ain't got much time for talking. I got work to do. Yeah, so have we. Where's your son? I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? Just like I said, I don't know. Now, anything else I can help you with? Don't get smart, Yancey. You know where Jed is, you better talk up. He took himself a little trip down to Mexico. Suppose you invite us in and tell us all about it. Reckon I don't have to have you in if I don't want you, Sheriff. He's perfectly right, Sheriff. So Steve and I will just wait here while you ride into town and get a warrant. Then we can invite ourselves in. You want to make us do it the hard way, Yancey? I ain't got nothing to hide. Want to come in? Come in. You keep a gun in the house? Shotgun there in the corner by the stool. How about a forty-five, Yancey? Never owned one. You haven't slaughtered any beef lately either, have you? Any log in it? Nobody said there was. Stashing the hides away under a boulder is a little bit unusual. You're getting kind of pale, Yancey. Now, there ain't no... Pro- What'd you stop for, Yancey? You're about to say there aren't any brand marks left on those hides, weren't you? You putting words in my mouth. Choose your own words, but answer me. Tell the truth. Where's your son, Jed? I told you he's... He's not in Mexico. He's holed up someplace recovering from a wound. The wound Doc Hemmett was killed for treating. I don't know what you're talking about. Jed ain't here, I tell you. Jace, look at that ladder there in the corner. Just a ladder? I was 
We're fixing to do some paint. A man who's going to paint usually buys some paint before he brings a ladder in. What's that up on the ceiling? Looks like an entry into the attic. Get out of here! Get out! Of here. No, you don't! Get your hands off that shotgun! Oh, that's better. I'll hold this for safekeeping. You might hurt somebody. Keep him covered, Steve. I'm going to use that ladder and see what we got upstairs. I'll help you, Jace. Jed's probably up there, and he ain't the kind to come quiet if he's cornered. That's Kill right, me. Sheriff. Get covered, Sheriff. Kill him, Jed. Shut up, Yancey. Don't move. Be smart, Jed. You can't get out of that attic. No. But I can blow the head off an animal that comes up here to take me out. I got to see you first. Remember that. We don't have to come up after you, Jed. We can rake every foot of that ceiling with gunfire. Yeah, that's just a sample. You can make it look like a sieve, and you look like one with it. Now, you better get down here with your father while you still got the chance. Come down, Jed. Come down, or they'll kill you. We didn't do nothing. They can't prove nothing. How about it, Jed? All right. But my leg is hurt. You have to bring the lad on to help me down. Sure. Just to make it friendly. Open that trap all the way and drop your gun down here. All right. Yeah, that's better. All right, Sheriff. Set the ladder up again. This is the gun we wanted, Steve. Yeah, 45. All right, Jed. Ease yourself down and I'll help you. All right. My, my leg hurts. Come on, come on. Look, we didn't do nothing. And that's all we ever going to see. We didn't do nothing, yeah. You'll love it up in Huntsville, then. It's full of innocent fellows just like you. You ready, Steve? Yeah. Sheriff? All set, Jace. Good. All right, Yancey, Jed, get moving. Throughout their trial, Yancey and Jed Coben steadfastly denied any crime. However, Jed's blood type matched the blood found in the office of Dr. Hemet, And ballistic experts definitely identified his 45 caliber gun as the weapon used to murder both Dr. Hemet and the cowboy whose body was found on Thunder Ridge. It took the jury less than two hours to bring in a verdict of guilty. The Cobans were sentenced to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of their natural lives. <laughs> Now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. I believe you'll enjoy an amusing story I heard recently. It comes from a young lady who lives in the Lone Star State. It seems that a Sunday school teacher was making quite an impression with the little ones in her class as she told how the pharaohs of early Egypt drove the children of Israel from that land. A little fellow in the front row was biting his nails fiercely as the teacher went on to describe the cruelties inflicted upon the Israelites, how they were beaten and driven forth without food or water. When the story was over, the young fry stared straight ahead. Finally, he snapped, Gee whiz, where were the Texas Rangers? <laughs> See you next week, folks. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Ed Begley, and Parley Bear. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Turn back the calendar. Tomorrow evening, the Railroad Hour takes you back to a golden, bygone era with a refreshing presentation of the musical comedy High Button Shoes. Railroad Hour singing star Gordon McRae is joined by Margaret Whiting for this program. And remember, tomorrow you'll also hear a concert by the Boston Pops Orchestra. Phil Baker invites you to join the $64 question next on NBC.